Okay, I think now is probably the time. <clears throat> Mitch, do you want to maybe introduce yourself? Absolutely. Um, to get to know you. Um, so this is making deeper connections, a conversation around building healthier, more fulfilling relationships of all kinds of relationships, romantic, platonic, family, whatever it is, uh, work colleagues maybe. Um, figuring out the kind of developing an understanding and some tools to be able to kind of manage your relationships and make them a little bit healthier. So to get started, to introduce myself, I'm Mitch. I'm a clinical therapist with SHIFT. Um, I primarily support individuals and couples. I do a lot of work in um, helping individuals and couples build healthy relationships, make sense of difficult and challenging emotions, um, and most importantly, improving communication. Um, so that's most of the work I do with SHIFT. I also help a lot of individuals navigate things like anxiety and depression, substance use as well, but my primary focus is on individuals and couples, sometimes families as well, um, developing communication, navigating emotions, um, and just making relationships a little bit better. Um, so tonight, Tiff and I are gonna have a conversation around um, building relationships. Um, I have a few ideas that I'm gonna share and then Tiff's gonna kind of ask me some questions about that. Is that yeah. right, Tiff? Yeah, absolutely. Cool. So just to give everyone some context, like who, who is this woman? <laughs> Um, my name is Tiffany. Um, I'm the marketing lead at Shift, and I'm non-clinical. So I think what's really fun about the kind of setup of these workshops is really bringing in someone, you know, out there in the field, you know, doing the work, having these experiences that don't necessarily see it through the lens of, say, a therapist or the clinical. I think what's also really exciting is getting to know Mitch in his in his journey, like in his career, and in seeing his strengths is also really exciting. Then communicating that into like, what am I seeing in my friends? What are you seeing in your community? communities, you know, what's going on out there. So for example, you know, right now we've been so isolated. Um, I've heard a lot of people actually saying, I don't know that I'm going to know how to have conversations when I get back out there in the world. So this is just kind of a unique opportunity because Mitch in the past has already touched on, you know, in, you know, for example, intimate relationships, how do you do a relationship check-in? How do you rebuild those boundaries? Um, he's written blogs about it in the past. And so let's take those ideas and let's make them across the board for healthy communication, healthy friendships, um, making deeper connections. So Mitch, I'm excited to be here. I'm so Sounds glad you great. chose me as a co-host. <laughs> Absolutely, thank you for joining me, Tiff. Um, so first question is what is a healthy relationship? Uh, it's a bit of a loaded question and there's no one way or one right, right way to answer it. Um, but there are a few elements that are fundamental to a healthy relationship that um, I've certainly observed with a lot of the couples and individuals I've worked with um, and just from you know living as a human as well. Um, so some of the things that are essential to a healthy relationship um, or making sure that both individuals' needs and expectations are being met within the relationship, um, which is easier said than done. It can be, take a lot of ongoing work to make sure that your needs and expectations are being met, um, requires ongoing communication, um, as well as you know what's essential to a healthy relationship is having a foundation of mutual respect, trust, and investment from each individual. So both individuals need to be able to respect each other. Uh, there needs to be a level of trust so they can offer the vulnerability required um, to have these meaningful conversations around meeting needs and expectations, um, as well as that investment to you know that you actually wanna get something out of this relationship. And not to say that relationships are purely transactional, but there is a transactional nature to them um, in that you know we put in social support, well, we, we put in our time, our mental, emotional, physical energy, um, and we like to see something in return from that. And if only one person is putting that in, uh, the relationship's not gonna be sustainable. Uh, do you have any questions about that, Tiff, or anybody else? I think it resonates with everybody, to be honest. I mean, okay. yeah, let's dive in. Sounds good. So how do we first build a healthy relationship? But the most important thing um, is communication. And I know that's a bit of a cliche to say communication is the cornerstone of healthy relationship, um, but it is true and it is essential. Um, so why is communication important? Is it important? Um, as I mentioned before, um, being able to make sure the needs and expectations are met within the relationship is really valuable. Uh, and the only way to do that is through communication. Uh, you can't guess, you don't want to assume. Um, so the more that you can communicate, um, the less opportunity there is for miscommunication, misunderstanding, misconceptions. Um, all of those things often contribute to conflict and tensions in the relationship. A lot of the work I do with couples, um, individuals, you know, trying to navigate complicated relationships um, is based on the fact that there's, you know, underlying assumptions or people don't know what the other person is interested in in the relationship, whether that's a friendship or a romantic relationship. Um, so you really need to have communication to be able to kind of make those things happen. Um, and you know you need to be able to feel like you can communicate what your needs are. And, and those things change and evolve over time. 
Um, so it's not a one-time conversation that you have and then you're good for the relationship. Um, part of the relationship is being able to kind of keep this conversation going throughout the course of, of your relationship. Uh, it's an ongoing conversation as your individual needs change and evolve over time. Um, so communication um, is something that you need to kind of focus on. There's a lot of ways that we can develop our communication, some of the ones I'll be talking about today. Um, so what's one of the ways that we can develop our communication? Um, is renegotiating or negotiating the terms of our relationship. Uh, this is something I advocate for a lot of individuals, again, and not exclusive to romantic relationships, but relationships in general. And when I mean negotiating the terms of the relationship, I mean working together, collaborating, having a conversation and talking about, again, what do you need in the relationship? What do you expect from the other person? What's your vision of this relationship look like? Uh, and I know that sounds like a really formal approach to kind of understanding how to navigate a relationship, um, but it's really helpful. And a lot of times people have these conversations more formally. They don't you know, label it as negotiating the terms of the relationship. I know a lot of times when you first start dating somebody um, in the first few months, you're kind of having these more informal conversations about you know, what you're looking like to get out of a relationship, um, what's worked in past relationships, what hasn't worked. And based on those um, informal conversations, you're essentially negotiating the terms of the relationship. Um, with that said, it doesn't hurt to make it a more formal conversation as well. Um, as well as you know, renegotiating it as well is a really important thing that you do um, because what works for the first couple of years of a friendship or a romantic relationship isn't necessarily gonna work three, four years down the road. Um, and even in family relationships, you know that the relationship you have with a sibling or a parent or something like that, it drastically changes throughout your life um, depending on various factors, maturity, um, how close you are, experiences and whatnot. So those are important things to do, again, not only with romantic or platonic relationships, but family members as well. That's such a good point because things have changed so much. And I mean, even bringing it to like a workplace level makes sense because, you know, you might have a coworker or, or a mentor or a boss who typically you could tell from their inflection and now by email, they sound so much harsher or more difficult. So even in the simplicity of like, because again, saying negotiating sounds so formal. Yeah. So bringing it down to the informal level of, you know, right now we're communicating only on email. So it would actually help me a lot if you let me know by X, Y, and Z, you know, what's happening here. Like, again, it sounds like, it sounds like a very formal statement, but bringing it down to real world examples can actually kind of help you find your new North star in each of your relationships. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for providing that example. It shows you how informal it can be just with checking in with each other to make sure that you're on the same page at the same time. Again, it doesn't have to be a romantic relationship. It can be that informal kind of workplace relationship that you might have. Um, but it's still that communication and understanding that you're understanding each other, um, that you're able to meet those needs. And that, yeah, like if we're not be able to see each other in person, if it's more virtual, how does that change your relationship? And based on those changes, you need to kind of make those adjustments. So I'll walk you through some points in terms of how negotiating the relationship might happen. Um, so oftentimes it suggests that you take time as individuals to reflect. So this is more of that formal approach to it. Um, typically, you know, in friendships, relation, romantic relationships, or with your family members, trying to reflect on, you know, how you've changed as an individual or what your needs are as an individual, um, what your expectations are, really trying to engage with yourself. So that when you show up to the conversation, you're showing up prepared um, and that you're not just kind of, you know, wondering, you know, yeah, maybe I'm not sure what my expectations or my needs are. Those are things that you want to feel pretty confident about um, so that you can be assertive about that as well and that you're not too passive. Um, so taking that time to reflect as individuals is really good. Um, taking the time to reflect together is also helpful. Um, collaboration is an essential component to this as well. Um, so it's not going to work if only one person shows up that's done the reflection and done the work prior to the conversation. Um, there needs to be that mutual investment. Like I said, for a healthy relationship, there needs to be that mutual investment from both sides. Uh, your relationships aren't going to be inherently perfectly balanced, and that's okay. Um, but you want to be able to kind of figure out how to stabilize that. Uh, so through collaboration, be, making sure that you're both on the same page, that's an essential component to negotiating or renegotiating the terms. Um, being able to offer vulnerability um, for yourself as within you know, the relationship as well. So when you take that time to reflect, you really need to be honest about who you are as an individual. You know, how have you changed what your needs are? Um, that's why going to therapy can be very helpful to kind of prod and poke at some of those more vulnerable points that you may not, you might have blind spots or biases towards. Um, and then when you do come to that conversation with the person that you're negotiating the terms with, um, you want to be able to be honest about what your needs and expectations are um, and not, you know, leave out anything that might be important. Um, the second or the another point is accountability. Um, so making sure that you're not just having a conversation, that you're going to follow through with that and talking about what does accountability look like for you uh, individuals within the relationship. So how do you want to see that accountability? 
So if you say, I have an expectation that you provide me emotional support, how do you expect to receive that emotional support? Um, does that mean you want you know, solution-focused support? Do you want empathic support? Um, it's really good to be as specific as possible, always on the area on the side of over-communication. Uh, there's no harm with that. Um, to be able to make sure that there's accountability. Um, and again, there's no room for misinterpretation, miscommunication, or any misunderstandings. Uh, and then another point um, that's really valuable when it comes to negotiating ter relationship terms um, is figuring out how you can bring vitality back into the relationship. Whatever the relationship is, again, doesn't matter what dynamic or form of relationship it is, you wanna make sure that you're feeling energized by it, that you're feeling you know, that verb vitality, um, you're getting what you need out of the relationship um, to feel like that. And again, as the relationships change, especially real long-term relationships, what makes you energized at the beginning of the relationship might not make you energized 15, 20 years down the road. Um, so you wanna, again, take that time as an individual to reflect what's required to have that vitality and energy within the relationship. Um, and perhaps if you're having trouble figuring that out, again, collaborating together, getting creative, figuring out how you can make this relationship still exciting. Um, so a, a really great opportunity to make, to improve the relationship or to just make it as good as possible. So some considerations when identifying your needs and expectations. So as I've mentioned a few times now, needs and expectations are essential part of the conversation when trying to build a healthy relationship. Um, so what are some of the uh, considerations that you should have? Um, attachment styles is one of them. Um, and I'm not gonna go too formal in terms of discussing attachment styles because there's a lot to discuss when it comes to attachment theory, um, but just a general kind of overview of attachment styles. Um, depending on who your attachment figures are in, your, in your, your, your childhood and adolescence, you know, those parents or guardians, those people that are um, providing you support throughout those formative years, what kind of role they played, how much security you were able to develop in those early experiences um, is going to impact the way that you navigate your adult relationships. Um, and, and so depending on your childhood and those attachment figures, um, you might have a secure attachment, an insecure attachment that comes in the form of avoidant, anxious, disorganized. Um, and so it's really valuable to kind of understand what attachment style you might have. Um, with that being said, attachment styles aren't static, they're not fixed. Um, and we don't want to, you know, put somebody into a box because it is fluid. We can kind of learn. The most important thing is that we're able to kind of identify what our individual and unique needs are based on our attachment style. So if you're more avoidant, you know, what does that mean in terms of a friendship? Um, letting your friend or your partner know um, that at times you may be avoidant when you get anxious and insecure, that's a really valuable consideration for them to have in that relationship. So again, you know, you don't need to formally self-diagnose yourself of what attachment style that you have, but having that consideration, perhaps talking to a therapist about some of those early childhood experiences will give you some insights about what your needs and expectations might be um, in navigating a healthy relationship for you. Um, another consideration to have is your love language. I'm not a huge fan of the term because it is kind of ambiguous and subjective, but when I think about love language with clients, I often talk about, um, you know, what you need to kind of see uh, in terms of feeling, you know, affection or support or love from the person that you're having a relationship with. So what are those signs and indicators for you? So some people, it might be, um, you know, buying things, material items, you know, I, I, if I don't get roses on Valentine's Day, then I don't feel like I'm loved. Um, for somebody else, it might, might mean like, you know, when my friend makes me dinner, that shows me that they really love me. Um, or when they offer me that empathic support, I know that they're being really considerate towards me. So considering, you know, what you need in terms of seeing that love um, and that affection and that consideration in your relationship is really valuable. Again, that's going to really inform what your expectations are um, and how you communicate to that person, how you expect those expectations to be met. Um, so we really want to make that clear. Um, another consideration um, is cultural context. So whether it's friendships, um, romantic relationships or within your family, um, a lot of times we're coming from different cultural backgrounds. Um, and that's going to, you know, impact the way that we understand relationships or navigate relationships um, or what we consider to be the norms in our relationships. So, you know, those are important things to consider, um, considering your parents' background, how they were raised as well. Um, that has a huge impact, as I talked about attachment styles. Um, so having that consideration can be helpful as well. Um, and just to make it clear, too, when we talk about attachment styles, if you have an insecure attachment, you know, we're not looking to blame those attachment figures like your, your parents or anything like that. Um, there's no sense in doing that. And, and oftentimes there's no intention of creating an insecure attachment style. It just happens for a variety of reasons. Um, the more important thing is to be able to identify your needs more accurately through that understanding and analysis.
Yeah, it's really interesting. I think there's a few points in there that you said that have some like really good real life examples. Um, so for example, like um, attachment styles, again, so for just in case anyone isn't in the chat, um, we're going to send out resources in case you guys are interested in finding out more and you don't necessarily know some of the, you know, phrases that we're using. So, you know, for example, with attachment styles, if, if someone's avoidant, maybe, um, they might feel someone pull away and rather than being hurt to protect themselves, they then pull away themselves themselves right so when you start understanding that right now i'm in this version of that this is my reaction to it can actually help you understand not only is this the way that i'm reacting to it but also this is the person that i'm with right so if someone goes through trauma maybe it's a best friend if someone goes through trauma for me i would want to bring everyone around me and i would want my cocoon versus i have such very good friends that they want to go alone they want to you know and again that's not exactly a relationship style but that's what each of our needs are different and so we expect to see in others what we do ourselves right there's um like I, I'm pretty sure there's a famous quote that says something like we see others as we see ourselves. And so that has to do with like, um, we assume, you know, maybe that they're going through the same experience and we all have such different experiences. So understanding that other people react differently, but then also have different love languages. So this kind of concept of the way we show up for others, like you were saying, how can we redefine it? The way we show up for others is the way we expect to be showed up for. And I think gifts, to be honest, I find of the five almost like the most troubling because it's hard to understand or not mm -hmm. troubling, sorry, um, confusing. I think one of the really great ones is like acts of service versus say um, words of affirmation. Mm -hmm. Like I know about myself, someone telling me you did a great job, I'm so proud of you. I'll ride high on that for the next week. But if I'm if I'm with someone that instead is acts of service and they take the garbage out for me, I look that I might look at that as no big deal versus they look at that as I'm showing you every day that I love you. And so what, what was a big breakthrough for me was understanding that's not just in a romantic relationship. That's also how my bosses show up for me. That's how my coworkers, that's how we interact with with each other so i think that granted it's not going to become this like grid that you reference every single relationship to but it helps like open up your mind to you know we're all going through it you know life in different paths and with different like frames and lenses on our experiences and so it kind of broadens the understanding of other people's reactions maybe absolutely and i think you made a really good point tiff in terms of how we often project our own needs and expectations onto other people. Absolutely. Um, this is something I was talking to a couple about last night. Uh, you know, the, the male in the relationship, he really expects that solution focused approach. So when he's dealing, when he's upset, when he's going through something, um, he wants his partner to offer him that kind of logical approach to, to solving the problem. Um, you know, real rational, pragmatic um, responses to it. Um, whereas partner on the other hand is looking for more of that emotional support, that empathic validation. Um, but, you know, he had been you know constantly offering her that solution focus because that's what he assumed he wanted because that's what works for him right so again it's that you know when you're having this communication you're able to kind of avoid um some of those assumptions that we often make or some of those projections that we're unintentionally making within the relationship um so yeah. i think that was a great point to bring that up for sure and just before you go to the next slide like i yeah. think that one of the other great examples in this like topic is like how you were saying negotiation right we hear that and we think oh my goodness i need to sit down at a table but in the same way like if we do our own inner work and we look at what are needs that i have like i need to feel appreciated for the things i do for our household or i need to get verbal confirmation that i finished this project on time and it's and it's good or whatever that might look like mm -hmm. when you start understanding yourself and doing that inner work to say this is what i absolutely need to feel positive in this back and forth versus maybe what are my expectations or what are my hopes then now you're kind of going inward and saying like not only like what's the baseline for me to feel vitality which i love mm -hmm. that you use that word earlier the vitality in it but then also like what's the sugar coating like what's the what's the thing that makes it even better what are the hopes or what are you know the things that could make it especially when you're looking for a romantic partner, um, mm -hmm. because then it lets you know, like, what's your baseline um, and what will you stand for and what won't you? So even getting clear on yeah. those, whether you know what your boundaries are, if you know what your needs are, then you can know if those aren't met. Now you're seeing more clearly what your boundaries are. Yeah, absolutely. You can kind of develop those boundaries based on those needs and expectations. Um, and like you said, you know, understanding what your baseline is, is really valuable. Um, and this is one of the biggest things I recommend people going to therapy for. There, a lot of people are like, I don't need to go to therapy. You know, I'm, I'm not depressed or I haven't experienced any trauma. You know, I'm cool. 
Um, but you know, if, if you've never talked to somebody more objective, you might not have a good idea of what your baseline is as an individual. Um, and, and that, you know, obviously I'm biased towards a therapeutic experience, but I think it can be really valuable to that extent. But I uh, agree. Just to interrupt, <laughs> I agree because going, I think going to therapy is like going, is like physical exercise. You don't go for a walk because you need it. You go because it feels better. It's daily exercise. It's like going to the gym. You don't have to go to the gym just to lose weight. You go to feel better, to feel more alert, to feel more in tune. And it's the same for your mind and your mental health. It's my personal Absolutely. opinion. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Great plug. I wish you go to therapy. Just my, my opinion. Um, so another tool that you can use to improve your relationship uh, and improve communication is establishing ongoing check-ins. Um, so just like establishing, um, you know, the terms of a relationship, negotiating those terms, um, checking in is something you can do ongoingly. You can do it every day, once a week, once a month, whatever is needed. Um, so if you're having more conflicts, it's, it's a good idea to, to have more check-ins. Um, and again, I do recommend making it a more formal thing. Uh, so one of the things I recommend to a lot of couples is doing a check-in on the first day of every month. Um, just to make sure, you know, where are you at? Um, are things working for you still? Uh, so you want to be able to develop a time that works for both of you, um, that can be consistent. Um, and I'll give you some examples of some questions that you could use um, during those check-ins. So things like, what concerns have you had as an individual over the last few weeks? Or have you had any concerns about us within our relationship over the last few weeks? Um, have you been feeling about us? Um, is there anything that's been making you feel stressed or anxious as an individual that I can support you in? Um, can I be supporting you better? Um, is there anything that you'd like to change in your life? If so, what is it? And how can we address that together? Um, in addition to that, you know, what have you been feeling grateful for within this relationship? Um, is there anything that, you know, I should know about? Um, is there anything else that you'd like to talk about? Or is there anything else coming up that requires more of our attention or preparation? Um, so again, having that really intentional conversation can go a long way. And I think during the pandemic, when we've been spending, you know, in, in the context of families or romantic partners, um, we've been spending a lot of time with somebody. Uh, we can feel like we're communicating, but reminding that it's, it's about quality over quantity in terms of communication. So you can have a day long conversation and not talk about anything meaningful. Um, so making sure that you're having that, you know, carved out attentional time to talk about um, your needs and, you know, how you can support each other and having that more meaningful conversation can go a long way. And again, avoiding assumptions, conflicts, tensions. Um, and, and again, it kind of forces you to check in with yourself as well. So prior to that check-in, taking a few minutes, even five minutes to just reflect on, you know, how, how, you, how have you been doing as an individual? Um, things that we don't really take the time uh, typically to ask ourselves. Um, we get really busy, wrapped up with other things. Uh, so it can be really helpful as an individual before that check-in to take that time to reflect um, and then to bring that in and have a more meaningful conversation. Yeah, it's so important because, and especially, I love that you gave these examples of open-ended questions. You know, we get so used to saying, how are you doing, right? Or, hey, what's new? Um, mm -hmm. And especially now in this past year, there's not a lot we have to talk about, right? Or, or maybe we do, not to make a generalization, but like we can kind of get stuck in what's new and then and we don't get into the, like, you know, the really interesting stuff. So finding, you know, new open-ended questions to say like, hey, what was the best part of your day? Or like, hey, how are you doing? Or like, hey, are you, you know, do you need any support? You know, it, it might not be like the sexiest of conversations, but it's the ones that are really going to last with people. And when you have those like valued people in your life that you can actually say stuff like that to, like those are the conversation or the connections that just kind of get deeper and stronger. Yeah. And they're not sexy conversations, but <laughs> having those conversations may pave the road to having more sexy conversations. Right, 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 right. There's You're that better. vulnerability and trust there. Yeah, so I love that. They're valuable. Um, on the topic of communication, how can we argue better? Arguments are going to be inevitable in any relationship you have with, you know, no matter what kind of relationship it is, romantic, platonic, family, friends, whatever. Um, we're going to argue and that's okay. Um, the, the point of arguing is to be able to understand each other better. Um, so how can we argue better? Um, the biggest thing is moving away from blame towards accountability. Uh, you know, there's no point of pointing fingers at each other. Um, oftentimes when someone, you know, screws someone over, it's unintentional. Um, and therefore, you know, it's no point in to blame it and say, you know, I hate you or whatever, but moving away from blame towards accountability, recognizing intentions don't negate outcomes, um, but saying, okay, you know, I know you didn't mean to hurt me, but you did hurt me. Um, so how can we reconcile that? Um, rather being like, you know, you hurt me and I'm never going to talk to you again. You know, it's, it's a bit irrational. Um, so we want to be mindful of the emotions that we have in within conversations. Um, oftentimes it's the emotions that cause these arguments to kind of spiral. Um, our emotions are very, very valid. 
and we want to really engage with them, but we also want to be mindful of how our uh, emotions might impact our thinking and our behaviors, because um, again, they can be very rational at times. Um, so that's something to be mindful of. Moving that's away really from- Oh, go sorry. ahead. Sorry. No, I was just going to no, ask. Go I think you're right in that, like, we do get caught up in blame. And I also wanted to ask, because I do think that this is kind of like a therapy quote of like saying, I feel statements. So I just wanted to get your opinion on like any guidance towards like, how do we in those moments when we argue, because it is, it's a natural part of life. It's a natural part of any relationship. How mm -hmm. do we make sure we're doing it in a healthy way? So is it, I feel statements, is it statements that say, you know, I recognize this or I'm hearing you. Mm -hmm. um, is it making sure we don't say I'm hearing you, but is it like, do you have any sort of like kind of suggestional scripts that we can kind of go yeah, back yeah. to? I feel you statements. I'm a big fan of them. It sounds really simple, but it goes a long way because it's recognizing um, that in that experience, when we're feeling really emotional, um, what we're thinking and feeling seems like to be reality, objective reality to us. And it might not be the same reality, the same person that we're talking to. So by saying, I feel, we're validating our own feelings, but also recognizing that might not be the experience of the other person and that's okay. Um, but in, in doing so, we're saying, you know, this is my experience and I want you to understand my experience. Uh, and like you said, Tiff, we don't wanna add that caveat of saying, I, I understand you, but, um, because it's saying, you know, sure, I, I might, I get you, but I, don't, I disagree with it or I discount that. Um, so we really wanna be mindful of how we're kind of phrasing those. Um, so rather than saying, you know, but you can say, you know, I understand you uh, and it's hard for me to accept this for this reason. You know, mm. why would you say that? But and, and think about that for a second and then try to finesse that a little bit so that you're not invalidating or discounting what they're saying at all, but rather, you know, offering your um, point of view yeah. uh, and, and something that's really valuable um, is to be able to really just validate each other because that really eliminates uh, defensiveness. Um, we feel defensive when we don't feel heard or understood. Uh, we're going to continue to, you know, just attack the person or repeat ourselves until we feel understood. And that can be a really frustrating and exhausting component of arguments. Um, okay. so really take, yeah, I need you to pause because you just said something I think so important. Well, you said a few really important things. And I think the one we just need to like take like five seconds and let sink in is like, we don't feel good when we don't feel heard or seen. It's so obvious, it's so simple, but think about it in the heat of a moment or the heat of even just a, I can't believe my coworker said X to me on Slack today. That sounded so snippy, right? There are these moments where we're feeling diminished, our experience is feeling diminished versus the second of in an argument when someone's upset or even if someone comes in very sad of like, I hear that, like, I see that this is so difficult for you. I see that this is heavy. You don't have to solve it. You mm -hmm. don't have to, you know, change it. You don't have to anything else. It's just a matter of like, this is, this, this is hard. This is hard. <clears throat> and you're just like acknowledging their experience. And the same way of what you said in an argument using like the simplest change of, instead of saying, but to, and I, I hear that's what you intended. And this is the way it came across to me. And so you see how I can't reconcile the two because of this, or this is why I need to bring it up so we can reconcile it together. And I think you also made a really good point of like remembering in those moments of heatedness, whether it is like a relationship argument, whether it's a coworker or whatever, um, that like ultimately, and this is the inner work you have to do where it's not ego and pride and all that other sort of stuff that ultimately on the other side, we want to be together on this. I want to be, you know, close with my colleagues. I want to be madly in love with my partner. I want to be, you know, tight with my family. I want on the other side of this to be joy and vitality, Mitch. Absolutely. Like, I love that. That's like the, the like three, three, uh, syllable word of the day anyways yeah. um but uh but I, I think that's the great thing and i think that when we get so like overwhelmed with emotion we can see red right or we don't see it anymore and we kind of get stuck in that stuff and that's where doing that personal work whether it's when you're single whether it's when you're alone whether it's like looking at you know the dark things you don't want to so that you can really get clear on how do i put my ego aside in any sort of interpersonal issue and realize like i want what's best for us and even it's a matter of showing that vulnerability in an argument you know the amount of times that I've had misunderstandings because we all do. And mm -hmm. in that moment, being able to say, I misspoke. I don't, I don't need, I don't need to even back it up. I misspoke. I did the wrong thing. I made the wrong move. How do we move forward? You know, like how do I eat crow or, and if you're not ready to, or you don't want to, or it's not the right situation of like, how do we, I did this and I believed in it. You did this and you believed in it. How do we move together, move forward together? You know, like sometimes it's as simple as just phrasing it that way. What do we do now? 
You know, what do we do together now? Let's, what's the next step? What's our next plan? How do we get past it? Absolutely. And and those simple kind of offers of validation, understanding really go a long way. Um, And if you don't understand the person that you're talking to, then just ask them to try and explain it better or in a different way. Um, Because again, it's okay if we don't understand each other, but we want to try and work towards having that mutual understanding. Um, We don't want to be antagonistic um, and and just assume things or, or, you know, if we don't understand and try to get them to understand us better, you want to take the time to make sure that they feel understood, that make sure that you feel like you actually do understand them and, and, you know, communicate to that to them. Um, And then, you know, take the time to try and explain what your, what your experience is. Um, So, you know, oftentimes I'll let people know, you know, make sure that you're delegating time within the conversation. So if if you're both feeling misunderstood, then don't try and talk at each other at the same time to reach that mutual understanding, but rather, you know, okay, I'm going to talk for five minutes to get you to understand me. And then, you know, let me know if you think you understand, and then we'll, we'll go back and forth. Um, So taking that time to make sure that you do understand each other is helpful. Um, And as I was saying too, you know, no one is right or wrong. Oftentimes in arguments, there's no point of getting hung up on you're right, I'm wrong. Um, again, we just want to be able to understand where each other is coming from. And if we can have a mutual understanding, we can still disagree about things. But as long as we understand and respect each other throughout the conversation, um, we're not going to get too heated. We're not going to see that red. Um, we're going to stay cool. And that's what we want to do. Uh, something else to be mindful of in arguing is being mindful of defensiveness. Uh, something that I've kind of talked about a little bit. Um, but understanding that, again, that defensiveness comes from that insecurity, the insecurity of not feeling understood or validated. Um, and, and so we're going to continue to offer that defensiveness until we do feel understood or validated. Um, but again, if you can catch yourself when you're getting defensive, rather than being defensive, let the person know, you know, I don't feel understood or I don't feel heard. Um, that gives them the opportunity to ask the questions they need to feel to, to understand you or to perhaps validate you. Um, so that's really valuable. And I think it, sometimes we get caught up um, in trying to understand each other is, you know, I can't offer that emotional empathy. And what emotional empathy is, is when we, you know, feel the emotion the other person's feeling. Um, we, and that's not a requirement to be able to understand someone. There's something else called cognitive empathy, which is just understanding on the cognitive level of what someone would be going through. That means you may have never experienced that emotion or that experience, um, but you have an idea of what they might be going through. You have an idea that they're struggling in that moment. That's all that you need. That's the only requirement for cognitive empathy. Um, so don't worry if you, if you can't necessarily exactly feel what the other person's going through. Um, but if you can take an effort to try and you know, cognitively understand what they're going through, um, that's all you really need um, to develop that mutual understanding as well. So the next thing I'm gonna talk about is the four horsemen. This is a concept of, developed by John Gottman in the Gottman Institute, um, which does a lot of research around couples arguments, um, trying to argue better, trying to have more productive conversations, trying to find the best predictors for healthy relationships. Um, So the four horsemen is four things that John Gottman recognized as being, um, you know, essential components to, you know, destroying relationships, essentially, the things that really impact it. So the first one is criticism. Um, So something to really be mindful of and recognize within when you're arguing with somebody, when you're fighting with somebody, Um, are you criticizing each other? Are you verbally attacking your, the personalities of the character of the other person. Um, you know, that's not good. You don't want to do that. Uh, instead of criticizing, you know, use those I feel statements, those I statements, express the, the positives there. Um, so, you know, really be mindful of criticisms. Again, when we're really emotional and we're seeing kind of red, we are more likely to criticize somebody and say things that we're really regret. Um, those are the really damaging points of a relationship. Um, when you, you know, call someone a horrible name or bring up something from their past, That's not something you can take back after that conversation, even if you say, I was emotional, I didn't mean it. Um, Those things really stick with people that, you know, informs their insecurities, that informs their belief system. We don't want to criticize each other's personalities or characters. Rather, you know, think about why you're feeling hurt. Use those I statements. Um, Try to be real with your experience. Uh, The next one is contempt. Um, Resentment, contempt, those are often things that contribute to a failed relationship, a relationship that's just, you know, toxic. it's attacking the sense of self with an intent to insult or abuse the other person. Um, and so again, rather than using contempt, try to build a culture of appreciation. Uh, remind yourself, your partner, the other person that you're talking to of the positive qualities, offer that gratitude, um, some of those positive actions. Uh, a client told me the other day that um, when he argues with somebody, he tries to have a gratitude sandwich, meaning that he starts by saying uh, you know, something that he appreciates or something he's grateful for about that person. Then he offers something that's bothering him, that kind of criticism, um, and then finishes off with another bit of gratitude or appreciation. 
Uh, so it's a good way to kind of buffer a little bit. Um, so it's a little less, you know, hostile and raw. Um, you know, that message is still going to be clear, um, but it's going to feel a little bit nicer because we know that person still cares about us. They're still communicating um, that, you know, they're important, that we're important to them and whatnot. Um, so that building of culture of appreciation can be really valuable um, when having difficult conversations. Um, the next one is defensiveness, as I've just talked extensively about. Um, defensiveness is victimizing yourself to ward off a perceived attack and reverse the blame. Um, really not great. It can also lead to gaslighting at times as well. Uh, and we don't want to go down that road. Um, so, you know, again, if you're feeling defensive, ask yourself, why am I feeling so defensive? Am I feeling misunderstood? Um, where is this insecurity coming from? Do I need to be feel validated? Uh, and then take responsibility. Um, try to accept your partner's perspective. Offer an apology for any wrongdoing that you've done. Don't use offensive, defensiveness as that scapegoat in an argument. Don't try to turn the argument back on yourself or to the other person. Um, you're not going to make any progress there. You're just going to make the other person feel pretty shitty. Uh, and again, you know, it's avoiding that accountability on both sides. Even if the other person did something wrong, um, you know, you can still take accountability to some extent. Uh, and there's no need to get defensive there. These three the that you have in a row yeah. here, defensiveness, take responsibility, and stonewalling, they're so important because they're they're obviously like so um, insidious. Like yeah. they really just they they kind of creep up and you don't even know what you do that you're doing it. So obviously it's so important that you check in with yourself about these things. But I'm wondering if you have any um, kind of like gut checks for <clears> people <throat> that think that might be happening. So for example, if they're they're trying to negotiate something with someone and they feel that stonewalling or defensiveness come up, you know, how do we navigate that? For ourselves when we're thinking okay they're being defensive or they're deflecting into a problem rather than moving into a solution like is there any way to internally kind of check in and and help to figure that out like if, if you're feeling defensive yourself or, or no i mean well sure that's a great example but i actually meant as well um if you see it in the other person like how can you then you know repivot if stonewalling or defensiveness or not taking responsibility is happening with you yeah yeah, so when the other person's uh, exhibiting that, um, communicate to that, that to them that you know you're not taking responsibility, you're deflecting, you're being defensive. Um, maybe take a few minutes to think about it. You know, just try and take a few deep breaths. You don't want to be antagonistic with these kinds of things, but you also do want to assert yourself, and you don't want to be walked on all over. Um, so be able to communicate those things assertively with respect, um, suggesting that the other person maybe take some space to think about it for a minute, think about why they might be defensive. Really trying them to get them to you know engage with that cognitive empathy to say, you know, understand my experience or try to understand my experience and understand how I might see you as being defensive right now and how that might not be productive for this conversation. Um, and asking them to do that is essentially asking them to take some responsibility, to take the time to, to kind of think about it. And if you feel like you're being defensive or, you know, you're not taking responsibility, you're stonewalling, asking yourself, you know, why that's the case. Um, you know, what's triggering me to do that? What are my emotions am I experiencing right now? How am I thinking about this experience right now? And how is that impacting my ability to navigate this conversation? Um, really important things to be able to ask yourself. This is a really good callback too, to like, you know, you're going through these different steps and these like levels of awareness. And you said earlier, you have to really establish your own wants and needs or your own wants and expectations. And I, I think that that's a great example of when, you, when you're able to, you know, or not able to, like it's a definitive list, but when you work on really seeing what are my baselines, what are my needs, um, what are my, you know, what you know what are the the borders the boundaries of what i will and won't accept in my own life then it means that when you're in these conversations and you're realizing for example someone's being defensive or they're lashing out at me then you can go back to that original boundary of my need is to not be spoken to this way or my need yeah. is to feel seen and heard by my partner and so if they're brushing me off then instead of making it about them you can come back to your core values of this is what i need to fit to feel fulfilled mm -hmm. and it might but i mean you tell me you're the you know you're the therapist but it feels like to me it would be much more freeing because then it's not about my relationship with that person it's about my core values my core needs and whether those yeah. are being met or not no that's that's a great point um and when it comes to something like stonewalling that's usually based off of an individual's needs so they're shutting down um oftentimes unintentionally because they need that time to kind of process it in some space um, and this is a, a, a very common conflict I see with a lot of individuals and couples where there's two competing needs. There's one person who wants to be confrontational and will resolve things right away because it's bothering them and it creates anxiety if they can't. And the other person needs that space to digest that. So there's a discrepancy in those needs 
and therefore, you know, they're at a standstill. Um, either one person's pressing to continue the conversation mm-hmm. and one person's shutting down and walking away. And that's one of those things where if you can recognize what your individual needs are, um, going into a relationship, whatever kind of relationship it is, to say, you know, I'm the kind of person that needs to take that time to process, to digest, uh, you know, that's going to be really helpful. Or if I'm that person that needs to, to be confrontational and re- resolve things right away, um, that's a really important consideration to have. And when those things are uh, competing, there's a discrepancy, making a compromise to say, okay, I know you need a minimum of 20 minutes to kind of think about things and digest. Well, after 35 minutes, we're going to come back together and finish this conversation. Again, there's that element of accountability, responsibility, and both individuals' needs can be met. Um, you know, you're holding the other person accountable to come back to the conversation, and that person that needs to kind of continue that conversation um, can do so and perhaps only ruminate in their anxiety for 30 minutes. Um, I think that's a su- that's such a super good point. Like just having that simple, simple script. Like, but like personally, I I do. I need to formulate my thoughts. I need to process. You know, I need to percolate like a coffee maker. And yeah. my ex, for example, was very much like the heat of the moment needs it now. If I walk away, he doesn't feel like he's got closure. And even having those simple, simple one sentence scripts of I'm feeling overwhelmed. I need about 20 minutes. Even just I'll set a timer. It's not sexy. It's not modern, but it's rational, right? Yeah. I need about 20 to 30 minutes. I'm gonna set a timer. I just need to collect my thoughts and cool down. I'm going to come back to this because this is important, right? Like find those versions of how you can say it and how you can apply it in your own life. And I also want to appreciate like people mentioning in the comments, like pausing the conversation is a good thing. It's a check-in that you could de-escalate. Like, thank you. And also if anyone else has any comments, because I want to be respectful of time and we're at about 15 minutes to the end. If anyone has any thoughts or ahas, please put them in the comments now so that we make sure to cultivate a little bit of time to um, to recognize them because um, we don't want to feel as though you're rushed after at the end. Um, yeah. So sorry, apologize. Go ahead, Mitch. We're loving no, this okay. presentation. Uh, yeah, I'll be wrapping up in a few minutes of what I have to say so we can open up for just general Q&A then too. Um, but just to finish this slide off, stonewalling um, is withdrawing to avoid conflict, convey disapproval, distance, separation, you know, just completely shutting down on somebody, ignoring them. Um, it feels awful when someone does that. So you want to be mindful if that's something that you, that's a habit that you've fallen into. Uh, so to combat stonewalling is you can use physiological self-soothing. So take a break, spend that time um, soothing, taking those deep breaths, reflecting, understanding your emotional experience, why you have that tendency to avoid stonewall. Again, bringing that attachment style back into it as well, informs that understanding that perhaps you're avoiding because you have that avoidant attachment style. When things get too heavy, you avoid, you run away, you ignore. Having those considerations can be helpful to let your partner know that's a habit or a tendency and that's a consideration to be had when having these difficult conversations. Um, The last slide I have is how can we build a deeper connection within our relationships? Just a couple of general points. Again, communication, we wanna think about having the quality of communication rather than the quantity. Um, So thinking about what kind of conversations you're having. Um, You don't need to be talking all day, but if you can talk a couple of times a week and have those really meaningful conversations to be able to support each other, understand each other's experience, that's going to help develop that deeper connection. Um, you know, when we can offer each other that, um, you know, vulnerability uh, and, and, you know, create that space and foundation of trust, that's going to really be really helpful for developing that deeper connection. Um, creating space in a relationship, which has been really difficult for a lot of individuals living together during the pandemic. Um, creating that physical space it has been a challenge. And we need that space to feel excited, curious, interested in our partners. Um, you know, there's a balance there. We don't want to have too much space and, and toward the point that we're feeling disconnected. But we want to be intentional about, you know, making sure that we have that independence and autonomy, whether it's with a family member, a friend, or a romantic partner. Um, developing that space um, leads the way to, again, that curiosity, that interest, that excitement. You know, you want to feel excited about being with that person. If you're with them all the time and you're kind of just sick of them, you know, it's not going to lend itself to a deeper connection or a healthy relationship. Um, so making sure that you you take that time as individuals and just when you say just because you say I want some time by myself it doesn't mean that you don't enjoy spending time with with whatever person that you're in a relationship with it just means that you still value your individual identity that time by yourself and again it lends itself for having a greater appreciation for when you do spend time together um, and then the last point I have is creating boundaries rituals and routines together um, so again creating boundaries about how much time you're spending together or uh, what you need in terms of those needs, expectations, and how letting that inform your boundaries, creating rituals together. I often tell clients, you know, you don't need a lot of time to be able to connect with your partner. Um, just that five minutes when you make coffee in the morning, having a brief, you know, look at each other or, or a quick chat, 
um, that can really lend itself to building that deeper connection. If you can make that a ritual or having dinners with family is a really great way, to, an accessible way to, to, you know, foster that deeper connection. Um, and that, you know, lends itself to that routine as well. Something that you can rely on. It offers a sense of security and stability within your relationship. So, you know, boundaries, rituals, routines, all very much important. Um, so that's all I have to say. Yeah, these I'll are really good points. Up. We have a few yeah. questions in the chat. Okay, I also sure. wanted to just add one other um, detail because I think you made an interesting point about like romantic relationships, like creating rituals. And I think there's also something really poignant of bringing that into say coworkers, family and friends mm -hmm. where like, because we all experience things differently, like how can we show up better? So can it be, a, you know, not just when there's conflict but also day to day, how can we really yeah. feel more connected? So for example, like how can we ask better questions? You know, like what's a highlight of your day? I have a girlfriend mm -hmm. who she says, what's your rose and what's your thorn of the yeah. day? You know, what's your high point, what's your low? Mm -hmm. Because you want to feel seen in that way. Just because I had a low point today doesn't mean I don't want to talk about it or it doesn't mean I need to get into it, but someone else just seeing me have it is really important. So that's kind of fun. I think there's also, I'm going to try and find it for the email when we send the resources, but I'm pretty sure like the New York Times or something had like a questionnaire of like 25 questions to ask for like the deepest connection or something like that. Okay, yeah. I'll see if I can find it, but it, 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 they are, they're those unique questions that we don't think to ask yeah, that, you yeah. know, we just kind of, you know, settle into our, <clears> um, anyways, our, our, our default, but like, there are those little things like, you know, how can you, if it's dinner with your family, how do you put your phone down? You know, or like, just how do you show up in different ways so that you're showing the other person you're there for them? Um, I think that's, it's also a really interesting thing when we feel longing and like, this is a broad statement, but I feel mm -hmm. like it's true for myself. When we feel longing, um, we can't just demand it of others. We kind of have to show up in that way to usher them the open door to join us in it in a deeper connection. Yeah. So in that way, like if I want to connect more deeply with a, you know a good friend that I'm having dinner with, I need to put my phone down. I need to be really zeroed in on it, and I need and that will help expect them to feel the same. And so when we show up for others, we allow them the vulnerability and we allow them the space to show up for themselves, yeah. um, which can be really uncomfortable for a lot of people. And it can be uncomfortable for ourselves, of course. Mm -hmm. um, but when we do that in our work or when we get clear what our needs are or our boundaries are, um, then we can actually show up fully and it allows more people to show up more fully. And I think that's really exciting and special, you know? Yeah, and, and communicating to those people in our lives how we expect them to show up is really valuable. Um, and like you said, you know, how can we connect on a daily basis? Asking, like, like you said, asking those open-ended questions rather than, you know, did you have a good day? Yes, no. We want to hear, you know, what was your day like? Tell me about, about, about your day. What was challenging for you today? Or what was, you know, great about today? Ask those more open-ended questions. That's going to lend itself um, to more of that deeper, meaningful kind of connection. Fantastic. So I just wanted to say, so Simon, yes, absolutely. We're going to send the slides, any of the resources that I can remember that we discussed, I'm going to try and link them as well. Um, to anyone who's registered, you'll get the email, which would be all of you because you have the link. <laughs> we had two really interesting comments in the chat. Um, okay. Anyone else feel free, we've got another 10 minutes. So um, we have a question here that says, do you have any insight about stonewalling and neurodivergence? Some folks on the spectrum and uh, ADHD as well, let yep. alone the spectrum, enter nonverbal states in conflict spaces. You know, which can go Absolutely. beyond stonewalling. It's more like shutting down. It's disassociating. Very interesting. How can we continue to argue, let alone converse or come back to the issue at hand with them? Okay, so that, that's a really great point. And again, that kind of goes back to needs and expectations, mm -hmm. um, especially when it comes to neurodivergent folks. And I'm working with a couple of people with ASD right now. Um, and then they're trying to, you know, navigate romantic relationships with those considerations, with being someone who's more, you know, you know neurotypical. Um, and, and it's really important to express those needs, to express that, you know, I do need that kind of space. Um, so setting that precedent, really being able to, again, know yourself and what your needs and what you need to feel comfortable and secure and having that conversation. Um, and if you end up kind of shutting down, um, go nonverbal, whatever it is that you're able to kind of communicate that to your partner that, you know, that's something that, that I need. I need that space. Um, and then, you know, again, developing a plan around that so that when you do have these arguments, when things get emotional, when you might shut down, you have a plan in terms of how your partner is going to support you through that, whether it's giving you space um, or again, whatever you need and support. So that really goes back to what your needs and expectations are um, and really communicating to the person that you're in a relationship with um, how you expect them to show up for you. Like I've said, you know, it's important that we communicate what our expectations are and exactly, you know, what I need for you to show up what I need for you to provide me that support. Yeah, that's super important. I also love 
you know, this whole conversation because one, um, it's important for us to vocalize what we need, but also I love that this individual is asking, I believe if I'm interpreting right, on behalf of someone else, because one, it means that this person is so invested in, you know, in um, the relationship with the other person they're talking to that they need to ask, they want to understand, they want to understand, um, you know, a mentality that isn't what they have. So already that's doing the due diligence of like, you care about this relationship, you want it to go well. And I think that's really, we can take that across the board to understanding like, we all love and communicate differently. So the more that we can create a space for saying to the other person, what do you need? You know, like this person, again, being on the spectrum, they might not be in tune to that, they might um, just kind of, you know, internal shut down and not be able to communicate that so the more we're able to recognize across the board um do you need time right you're seeming really overwhelmed mm -hmm. do you need a few minutes to collect yourself or it feels like you're shutting down i understand this is really overwhelming do you do you want to regroup in 20 minutes like that sort of thing like because again when we lead with kindness and we lead with understanding that we're trying to get on the other side of this together Again, no matter if it's in the work, if it's your family, if it's a loved one, we're trying to get on the other side of this together. So how do we how do we do that? Help me yeah. help you. You know, yeah, that's, that's a really, really neat. great question, and it, and it you know it shows the importance of having consideration for neuro neurodivergent folks um, based on what their needs are as individuals. And that's something I've talked to a few people about recently. About you know if you're neurodivergent, your love language might look a little bit differently, and, and you know that that's great and that's okay but it takes a bit more consideration to say you know i'm not going to pick up on those you know cues. regular social cues or yeah. you know the way that i perceive affection or provide affection might look a little bit differently and again as long as your partner understands that and knows that or your friends or your family understands and knows that um then it, you can have a healthy and successful successful relationship you just need to be able to have that mutual understanding um, and that capacity to be able to still connect with each other um, but you can determine how you make that connection happen Absolutely. So we have another one here. So going back to the beginning. So when we were, when we first started talking about renegotiating relationship sure, yeah. terms, is there maybe some more examples you can use of what needs one might have? So for example, yeah. if it's, um, you know, I need to hear you missed me, or if it's, you know, I need to hear verbally that you appreciate me or whatever you might, what you might think. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it could be those things, those signs of affirmation, you know, mm -hmm. what do you need to feel loved and supported? And might, you might say, you know, I need space. I need to have this amount of time in the evening to myself to, to just, you know, unwind. Um, needs can that, be- That's anything. a really interesting point. I don't think that's normalized enough. Like in my previous relationship, I, you know, it was, it was awkward to say at first, but I said, you know what? I sometimes I get overwhelmed living in a small space with someone else. And I kind of just need to go in my room and watch my own shows for like an hour or two by myself, or mm -hmm. I just want to scroll on social media by myself. But I think that like being able to say that out loud means it's not about you. And it's not about me unplugging and being on social media or whatever the yeah. example is. It's actually just a matter of like decompressing. So yeah. by being able to get in front of it, by being able to own it, by being able to say, my need is just to be in a in an alone space doing whatever I choose to do in there, you know? Yeah. And it's not that I don't love you. I just, I need an hour and then I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna love you more. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, and again, those considerations of cultural context too, you might, you know, your, your partner might not be close with their family um, in within your culture. You're still very close with your family. You might say, I need to talk to my mom every night. Um, and that's just one of my needs. And that's something I need you to respect. Yeah, that's a really um, good point. Something I've been hearing more within the couples I'm working with is couples, you know, starting relationships and saying, you know, I, I can't be in a monogamous relationship. I need to have the ability um, to be able to see other people, to be polyamorous or engage in ethical non-monogamy. And that's one of my needs to create a healthy and sustainable relationship. Um, so really, again, being able to be honest with yourself and the other person about what what, what are the requirements and conditions that are, that are gonna create a healthy relationship for you. And again, that requires that individual work to be able to identify those needs. Um, so it can be difficult to, to again, yeah, label what, what are needs, what are my individual needs? If you've never given that thought before, it can sound a little abstract. Um, but you know, when we think about needs, just take the time to reflect as an individual um, and think about what is it that helps me feel secure in a relationship? What, should, what makes me feel invested, energized um, uh, in, in a relationship in general? What are those conditions? Those are going to reflect what your needs are. Um, and, and again, those expectations of how those needs are going to be met. Um, what you need to feel secure. Again, going back to the attachment styles. Um, what is it that I feel I need to feel um, you know, affirmed and heard in the relationship? And how do I expect my partner to meet those needs?
I think Hope these that are, helps. Like, yeah, no, absolutely. Like there's so much of what you said. It's so fun because I get to talk to you so often, but there's still so much that you said in the last hour that I'm like already reflecting on, you know, all sorts of different communication styles in my relationship. Um, but I think, I think like not even to create a summary, but we're in the last minute here to sort of create a summary. Yeah, yeah. I think what's really powerful is it really does come down to ourself. It comes down to our self-worth, our own boundaries, our own needs, and our own passion of like, what do we need to be fulfilled? And that can be re a really foreign concept to a lot of people. Um, it can be really hard to cl clue into that, whether you've always put your needs on the back burner, whether, you know, you are just starting your kind of like self work journey of like getting to know yourself, whether, you know, there's a plethora of reasons, but I think that like, what it sounds like is the more we really get to know ourselves. And, and even if it's bullet points saying here are my needs and they become more eloquent and they become more, you know, advanced and they become more detailed afterwards. But when we start putting those things into the forefront of our clarity and what we need, but also what we value, then it means that it's going to reflect in all of the external relationships that we have, because we're going to know this person, one meets my boundaries, two meets my needs, three makes me feel feel fulfilled and excited and happy and safe. Um, so it's kind of creating this framework for success, if anything. It's my little, yeah, no, <laughs> my absolutely. little summary of what I'm hearing you say. Um, and again, when it comes to needs, your needs are going to continue to change and evolve over time. So that's not something that you can just reflect on once in your life. You want to do that on an ongoing basis. And it doesn't have to be hard. You'll be going for a walk or doing yeah. journaling. Some may recommend a lot of people do um, to just reflect on how your needs have been changing depending on external factors, stressors, demands, different yeah. life stages and whatnot, you know, these, those needs are going to continue to change. Amazing. Thank you so much for this time, Mitch. Um, thank you everyone for being present, for your comments, for your, just your presence, really. Um, absolutely. We're going to be sending a follow-up email tomorrow. It will include the slides. It will include any resources we can remember to give you. And it will also give you um, a link to Mitch's past blogs, which is like, you know, checking in with your partner, as well as a link in case you wanted to follow up with Mitch or book him for, you know, you can do like a, you could do a meet and greet consultation, or you could book him for an appointment. Um, so thank you all so much. It's just, it's so nice to be here all together, even though, you know, we feel disconnected. It really, it feels nice to be here with everyone and talk, um, after this year of disconnection, feel like we made some connection today. Yeah. Thanks everybody <laughs> for showing up and creating a space to have a conversation. Uh, it was cool to see so many people show up. So thanks. I hope you got something out of it. Oh, I'm so glad we're seeing like we're seeing happy faces in the chat and it makes me very, very okay. happy. Um, thank you all for sharing this space together. Um, we will definitely email you tomorrow, follow us on social or follow us in um, the email. We'll give you our upcoming webinars. Me and Mitch have a few fun ideas to come. So hopefully we will tell you about them shortly. Cool. Fun ideas for webinars. We're gonna have more <laughs> cool webinars. That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> okay, everyone have a lovely night and uh, have a lovely day tomorrow. Yeah. Bye, everyone.